Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Book Leads Impactful Books for Life and Leadership. I'm your series host and leadership performance coach, John Germillo. This series is about getting to the books that have impacted the lives and the businesses and the work of the people in my network. Uh, whether it was existing at the time network or expanding network, the network has grown since I started this series, just referrals upon referrals. So I'm very lucky in that sense. All of these people doing great work. I want to get to the books that they have read or that they have written that really makes an impact on them, makes an impact on their clients, makes an impact on their audience. I want to get those referrals to these great books that have impacted impacted them in that way. That's why they are those, those book leads for me. So in this particular series, I cover three categories of books, books that they're schooling me on that I haven't read, a book that we've both covered um, that we are either reading for this series or we've read in our previous lives before we even met. Uh, and then the third category is when I bring on the authors and or publishers to talk about the messaging of the book, what it is that they want to put out there, what they want people to take away, putting a face and a voice to that messaging. I think what I love about this series is just these authors, these guests, whether authors or not, come off the page, you learn who they are, you, they hear, uh, you hear their stories. And based on those stories, you get insight into why they think the way they do about that book and how they're using those tools. So in this particular episode, my author, my guest will be author uh, Atlas Altman. And Atlas is a four-time best-selling author, former United States Air Force senior officer with experiences in communities like the White House, conflict zones, and special operations. Atlas was recently voted as one of the nation's top 150 unknown speakers and he is currently the CEO of Leaders Kit, an organization that helps proven leaders. He resides in Phoenix, Arizona with his family, and he had reached out to me after learning about the series, what I'm trying to achieve with this project. I still call it a project. Um, I, I kind of want to keep it in that phase, uh, my experiment here, if you will. Uh, Atlas, thank you for reaching out. We compared notes about each other's work, and we figured this conversation was uh, was meant to happen so you can share about your book, your experiences, and I'm glad to have you here. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah, absolutely. Love your work, man. Uh, every podcast that I listen to has a different flavor and yours has so much impact. It's so, it's so deep and rich. Um, it's just so good to be a part of this. If it's a project, awesome. But uh, this is a movement, man. I mean, you're really creating a movement of information that's going to dominate, uh, you know, in leadership uh, because the different perspectives that you're pulling together are just phenomenal from you know, TEDx stages to people that have decades of experience and then they're bringing in their knowledge and you're putting it all in one place, man. I just got to commend you real quick, John, because that's phenomenal work. And I know it's not light. I know it's a heavy lift. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I got three kids at home. Uh, The last one just turned like, you know, she's 14 months maybe right now. And people ask me how I'm doing this. And it's just the, the high of it. I'm not going to lie, man, like yeah. talking to all these people about their, this is a, you know, I, I, I got my bachelor's, I got my master's, I got an MBA, but this is like life education here, you know, talking yeah. to all of you, picking your brains, picking your brains on your work, the, the writing that you're doing, the books. That, I mean, somebody asked me, what kind of people do you want on your series? And I was just, it was just very general. I yeah. want people that are changing the world. Ooh. It may sound hokey, but they're changing the world. You can get, when you're going through LinkedIn, you can get a flavor for who's just kind of sharing information, engaging, liking, and who is out there doing the work. I want people that are intentionally trying to to change the world. And it's, it is this growing catalog. So I appreciate you taking the time just to uh, see what I'm trying to put together. I really do appreciate that very much, man. Yeah, man. No, I, I have a very similar background when it comes to education and what I found, um, in in my undergrad and my master's and my MBA is a lot of the same flavors. You know, everyone's got their proven whatever system that anyone can learn. And, and whenever you try to duplicate that without your own flavor, without listening to something like this, you find yourself in a predicament, man. And so offering this type of information from proven people that are just dominating and changing the world, like I said, man, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you for your time, dude. Um, as, you, as we start, as you know, I want to know who you are today, Atlas. I want to know, you know, what do you, what does your work look like with your clients, with your speaking engagements? Give us a little flavor of what you're up to these days. Yeah, man. Um, so 
Uh, I just finished uh, almost three decades of, uh, of being in the Air Force, uh, where I, I worked in a lot of awesome jobs. I came in right out of high school and uh, I came in to study leaders, man. I mean, where were you going to do that? It's the biggest corporation in the world is the United States military. So I wanted to go there, man. Um, and I signed up for a job that, that most people wouldn't sign up for. I signed up to be an administrator uh, so I could be around commanders and see how they make decisions. And then that turned into being around uh, really high ranking four star, three star, two star generals, uh, senior civilians. And then I got to see the sausage being made of leadership at that level. And I was like, man, there's probably more to this. And there was. Uh, I got a scholarship. They put me through officer training school and uh, I started leaders. And that's basically what you do in the military is leadership studies. So after three decades, I, I got put in a whole bunch of elite organizations and I was taking notes, man. I was like, this is gold. This is stuff you just yeah. don't learn. And uh, you read about it, but you don't yeah. you rarely see it in action at that right. level, you know, with yeah. that much urgency, with that much on the line. Yeah. So exactly. Uh, so I'm looking at these leaders and uh, I'm seeing their successes in every organization that I'm in is winning like these major awards and we're saving like millions of dollars and we're making things happen in the world. I'm on the sidelines of history. And yeah. uh, as I go out to a war zone or a conflict zone or a humanitarian mission, and I'm seeing all these things really happen, not just on the news. Um, I start taking all these notes and I had these big binders of notes. So uh, about three, four years ago, I was at Joint Special Operations Command and I was like, hey, I'm going to retire. This is the this is the best job I can ever retire out of. And, uh, and then I got a call and they were like, hey, how would you like to be a director in Afghanistan? And I was like, absolutely. After the White House, <laughs> you know, I can, I can go be a special operations director in Afghanistan. Send me, yeah. man. Don't tempt me with a good time. That's that's leadership gold. So, yeah, um, I went over there. The the general uh, interviewed me. He's like, why do you want to come over here? I'm like, are you serious, man? Like, uh, so I got to do that. That was probably the highlight of my career, even over the White House. People hear that I was in special operations and in the White House and they always want to know I was the White House. I was like, what about like this cool job that I did? This is. This, this is probably the best thing that I learned, but no, at, at, uh, at the end of my career, I started taking all these notes and I, I started looking at the patterns, right? Like, like we're trained to do. And, uh, and I found this pattern and, and it's a, a different flavor because of the political experience that I got exposed to and the uh, special operations elite units that, mm -hmm. that picked just like highly selective people to be in them. And then um, I saw a different leadership strain than normal military, normal corporate America. And I saw this this thing unfold and I was like, man, this is a book. And so I started reaching out to my friends that have written books and they're like, you got to get published, man. That's good. So um, one of my friends introduced me to Harvard Business Review and I started working with them. And uh, and then I, I heard David Goggins uh, say something that was magical uh he, he said david goggins special operator if you're if you're uh, folks oh yeah who, yeah who, who are in that goggins here. voice you know yeah yeah he cusses a lot because he's a sailor um and we had the same circles so i kind of got turned um to him a little bit earlier than most people found out about him but what he said when he published his first book was don't let anybody publish your book because then someone else is going to have a say in how you can say what you need to say and yeah. uh, that's going to impact your ability to do the change that you want to make. So I pulled it back from from him, uh, from David, uh, from David's words. I pulled it back from Harvard Business Review. I pulled it back from another really well-known publish publisher, and I started doing it on my own. And uh, yeah, man, that that turned into this book that's about to launch on the end of the week uh, for pre-sales. Uh, I actually have the 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 copy of it uh, to see what it what it'll look like um and that that's got to be that's got to be a surreal <sighs> moment man just man. um you know especially years of capturing ideas years of taking those man. notes to compile it all 
And then that one day I've seen it with so many authors, authors yeah. on LinkedIn, when they get that book and they open that box and they crack it open and yeah, uh, it's gonna be yeah. Really surreal. Yeah. It's so it is the book itself is actually out of my head and into the world. And that's a big deal. But out of that book, um, I, I had these other kids books, these kids leadership books that popped off. Um, my son and I worked on those for the last three years and, and we have a couple of them um, that have went number one in worldwide bestsellers. And then this one is uh, guaranteed to be a bestseller. It's already sold thousands. So uh, whenever it gets launched, that'll be my fifth bestselling book, which is, it's weird, man. I'm just a dude, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I just took a bunch of notes and I feel like a student and like now people are, are bringing me onto shows and on the stages as an expert. And it feels like yesterday, man, I just went into the military and now I'm done. <laughs> and now I get to tell people a lot of stories. Yeah. I, yeah. I Storytelling. I mean, I've talked about it on here where we're not really good storytellers, even though we have amazing stories to tell if somebody takes the time to look at our lives and look back and just note all the milestones. Um, yeah, you're like, I'm just the guy who's who's doing his thing, who's going through life, who's going through his career, is passionate about his career, his his trajectory, his experience. I think so many people just they don't really understand what they have in terms of their their background, their history, their experience, their stories. I think so many people have great stories in them, but they yeah. just never get they're not lucky enough to get to the point where somebody points it out the way your network, your friends pointed out that you have something here. You know, you have that firsthand experience that no one else very rarely has. Um, so it's just telling your story, man. I mean, again, yeah, you're, yeah. you're collapsing it all. You're capturing the the highlights and the best information for the world to, to see and take away. Especially, I love the fact that you get into the kids' books. I think that's powerful. I've always brought up on here that I have a specialist on here with me, and I'm always curious how they would address the the younger generations yeah. um so atlas then what does that look like for today is it mostly speaking is it coaching what what is it what is a leader's kit what can somebody yeah. find if they go on the website what kind of value does your company provide so i help through i help three ways i help people become best-selling authors and on on that tip i usually start with a kid's book because if you can explain it to a kid dude you can explain it to anyone so yeah. whenever you get it down to a simple nugget of what you want your story to look like, you can start to make that story resonate and actually impact people instead of just telling somebody a story that no one cares about. Um, so I help people become a bestseller um, and I usually do it with kids books. Uh, so I've got clients to do that. Um, I do it really, really inexpensively. Uh, you can actually go to my website and pick up my exact process that got me to bestseller number one for like a hundred bucks which people are like, Hey, you need to up the price. I'm like, bro, I want people to get their stories out. I don't, I don't, I don't really care about money, bro. I don't need money. <laughs> I just yeah. Need yeah. People, I need people to like really get this done and understand it, you know? Um, so I have that. Um, I have a coaching executive coaching program, uh, which is a bolt on. I only do three of those a year. Uh, I have two spots that are, are opening next month. Um, and I do that for a year. I run companies through uh, a big process that allows them to get to the next level. I see people stick in at eight and $10 million and that's a comfort zone for a lot of people. Um, and then I just help them get away from managing it every day. Because if you're in the business all the time, you're not going to be able to sell that business at all. And you want your family time, man. You know, you want to be able to spend that time doing something. I, I help people get away and mm -hmm. um, and actually put other people in charge of the business so that they can do something that they love instead of do something they're tied to. Um, and then the third the third thing is stages. I get on stages and uh, I help people with uh, their ability to speak, their ability to pull words into uh, into a thought process and pull it down. And then I use some of my process, like my book, my uh, rule of three book, dude, you can digest this in 10 minutes. Um, so I, I tell people how to like do that. Um, I'm like, hey, this book, it was really thick. And then I made it smaller. 
And then I made it smaller <laughs> again. And then I made it smaller again. And now I can sit yeah. on the stage for 20 minutes and tell you exactly what this book says. Yeah. Or you can pick it up and digest it for 10 minutes in 10 minutes. So 30 years can can condensed into 10 minutes. That's pretty good, man. No, that's but, amazing. That's amazing. Um, and now Atlas to to kind of figure out your path to where you are now and mm -hmm. and you you started at your military what did your what did your 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 first steps into any kind of career whether after high school or some other period what were those first steps into okay what is my career going to be what is my future going to be what did that look like was it guided by family was it guided by somebody that was in your family in the service was it something random that happened what were those initial steps that led to you whether education or not to start building your career whether you knew it was going to lead to where you are or not yeah john that's a that's a great question. I love it when you ask that question to other people too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so for me, like who knows what they're what they really want to do? Like that's always the hardest thing, especially today. There's so many things that you can do that you're distracted by a lot of things that you want to do instead of the things that you're really called to do. Mm -hmm. uh, for for me, at a young age, I was told stories about my great grandpa who arrested the Boston Strangler. You know, and he was a he was a great policeman. And then my grandpa was in special operations and he did uh, the first uh, helicopter mission ever in war. So the movie We Were Soldiers Once with Mel Gibson, yeah. that was my that was my grandpa's unit uh, for, wow. for his first tour. And then the second tour, he did special operations in a unit that I got assigned to later in my career. Wow. And then my dad was. You know, he he was in the same special operations base when when uh, when he adopted me after after my dad left us um, really early. And like so I've always been involved in a service type of lifestyle. So I, I knew I wanted to do police work or military work. And uh, I chose uh, the Air Force because my dad sat me down. He's like, hey, don't go in the Army. <laughs> the Army's great, but like you can get so much more exposure to what you want to do, which it, he's like, let me tell you your strengths. And I love this. Like, my dad is phenomenal at this. He's like, you're a strong guy. Uh, you really, really pay attention to what people are doing and how they do it. Um, I think the Air Force is going to be the best way for you to pursue whatever it is that you're going to do. And he was right. I mean, I got so many opportunities that I probably wouldn't have never got if I would have joined the army because I would have been focused on PT, you know, my physical fitness and how I shoot and how I move and maneuver instead mm -hmm. of the Air Force's, you know, what school are you going to? Uh, what books are you reading? Um, how can you help others? It's just a different, and I've worked in army units, man. I've worked in a lot of army units. It's just a yeah. different flavor of military in the air force and now the space force too. So, um, so that's how, that's how I kind of came about this. And then while I was in the military, my third command, uh, we had, uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, come in and put together a course. And I was like, Hey, this is a, this is a good course. It could be better. And, uh, I started calling my other commander buddies. I'm like, Hey, you guys getting this? And they are all getting different types of leadership courses. And yeah. none of them were, were hitting the mark, man. Cause you know, we go through, uh, we go through a lot of things like a Maxwell, we go through John Maxwell stuff. We go through uh Simon Sinek, which he's okay, but like, he doesn't have any leadership experience. So his is mostly academic and then whatever yeah. he pulls from other people. And then, um, we have a, a whole bunch of just leadership stuff. And then, uh, someone tries to come in and customize uh, a course and no one really hits it. Uh, for the middle portion of upper management and uh, and leadership of leaders. Mm -hmm. So I started putting together a course and then started teaching people in the Air Force. And they were like, hey, this is the best course I've ever taken. I'm like, say that again? <laughs> so how, how far was that into your military career? That was like, what, in the middle, towards the end? Or wh when are you starting to put that together for people? That was eight years ago now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and then I started the business about four years ago um, to where I can actually step outside and help corporations with the same course. So I started teaching like a, what I like to call a targeting uh, course. So instead of going after goals, 
most people miss goals. If you miss a target, you just reassess and shoot again. Yeah. So I produce a uh, targeting uh, course for people that helps them with their word selection and then how to pick the right things for people to do. Uh, and then, yeah, a whole lot of lessons learned there, of course, you know, with the leadership, it's just, everyone's got a different perspective, man. And everyone thinks that theirs is the best and yeah. dude, it's totally personal. How oh, you yeah, lead is absolutely. totally personal. Absolutely. So, I think any, anything I try to share online, anything I write about in a blog post or whatever it may be, I always put that caveat of, listen, this is my idea. This is my opinion. This is, I'm just, you know, um, spitballing here based yeah. on what I've seen with leaders that I've worked with. Um, it's not, it's not cookie cutter. It's never cookie cutter. No. Take from all this, even in my newsletter, take from this, what you will take from this, what resonates with you. But yes. if somebody comes in and says, I have the absolute recipe for that's going to work for every single person in their life development. Because to right. me, leadership is very personal. You yes. know, you're not just dealing with a leader and then at the end of the day, they walk home and they're a completely dis different person there. It's very personal. So I love that you bring that up, stressing that it has to be customized, that it's not one size fits all. Yeah, John. Yeah. So I I actually did a show with uh, Ramona Shaw about six years ago now um, called The Leadership Catalyst. And I brought this up and the thing that I was teasing out there that I've worked on for since then is leadership is a voice. Like when you have a voice as a kid, it doesn't matter whether you're a boy or a girl, it changes. But as a man, like my voice changed a ton as I gained experience. Now, what I, what I shared with her and what I'll share with your audience is like, I always try to mimic my dad or I try to mimic my uncle or I tried to mimic somebody that I wanted to be like whenever it came to my voice, but everyone knew I was faking and they were yeah. like, what's wrong with yeah. you? You know, <laughs> and like what, why are you, what, why are you talking like that? And yeah. that's what I see a lot of leaders do, especially when they get into like the red zone of leadership. Like when it matters, they're like, well, let me get some other perspective here to make it look like I know what I'm doing, bro. You're at the red zone. You know what you're doing. Just do it. Like yeah. whatever it is that you're, what you did to get you in that red zone, keep doing it and you'll get across that goal line. Um, yeah. but a lot of people don't see it that way. They just, they, they hear something and they're like, I'm going to use that. Yeah. And I think if you parrot it, I mean, people are going to sense people are a lot more perceptive than we give them credit for. They're going to sense that, you know, yeah. you're you're working from a script. It's not really you. You're not really feeling it. It's not genuine. It's not authentic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, their trust is like, uh, you know, what if the script goes away? If, is this person going to be able to really step up into their own voice with right. their own voice of experience again? I think a lot of leadership is storytelling. So if you can't look to your to your own experience and bring your own voice forward, you're you're yeah. kind of screwed in some sense. Atlas, when you were adopted by uh, your father, how old yeah. are you? I was five. Okay. Um, yeah, he was a. Yeah, I, I kind of get choked up uh, when I talk about it, um, but yeah. During so my, was it it was it his his grandfather and his father that you were talking about, or was it your your biological? Yeah. Okay. That was all my biological. Um, no, so my you had, uh, you had that amazing mix of like the yeah. biological lineage and then your stepdad that steps up and just yeah, man. Well, so uh, this book I'm going to introduce this to your audience. We yeah, talked yeah. about it a little bit. Um, cool. It's called it's called Games People Play. Okay, uh, by Eric Byrne. Now this book was written in the '60s and it's a psychology. It's still a psychology uh, staple. And what the book says is that your formative years happen between the age of four and eight. So what Dr. Byrne says is uh, you choose what you're going to do based off of your influences in the ages of four to eight. You're going to pick the person that you marry, what you're going to do in your life, what makes you happy, what makes you just have, you know, just disorganized. All the things that happen in your life happen between those ages. Um, and there's some other things in there that are phenomenal that I absolutely love. It's a hard book to get through the first couple chapters, but once you're in it, you're like, holy crap, this is cool. Um, and yeah. he says some things in there you just can't say anymore. 
<laughs> yeah. just, our society does not allow that. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I pulled away from that was during that time, I had my biological, you know, and my, my adopted family in my life. So I saw the world a little bit differently as a child than a lot of people do um, whenever they have to select one or the other. So it's not binary. I was definitely fluid when it came to awareness. And it's one of those things that as a military kid, you know, you're always a new kid. So uh, whenever we moved to Louisiana, I didn't talk like them. Uh, whenever okay. we moved to California, I didn't dress like them. You know, whenever yeah. we moved to Ohio, I'm like totally sticking out, you know, so <laughs> like in nomadic lifestyles, uh, they, they bring in a different perspective. Yeah. And I didn't really get it until I read his book. I was like, oh, that's why I'm thinking differently than uh, my friends. And, yeah. and that's okay. It's every, like I said, everything's different for everybody. Um, but but he pointed that out. There's some other things in there I'll, I'll tell you about. I love that book because uh, he describes uh, stroking your ego. So okay. if you've ever heard of that, he describes three egos and he describes it using alcohol. So he says there's three egos. Everything that you decide to do is in a child ego. And then the snowman's up to the uh, parent or to the adult ego and then the parent ego. And it looks like this. Whenever you're at a friend's house and they're like, hey, would, would you like a drink? And you're like, nah, I shouldn't. That's parent to parent conversation. And then he goes, come on, man, just one. And then it goes down to adult. So you have one drink and now you're both drinking. You have one drink, you're responsible adults. And then it turns into the child. And the child has two egos, the one that listens and the one that doesn't. <laughs> so, so the child ego looks like this. Hey, man, you've had a couple drinks. Let me have your keys. And the child that listens goes, yeah, that's good. No. Here's, here's my key. Yeah, you can see where this is going, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the, uh, the child that doesn't, it's like, no, it's my car. You step off. Like, I can handle. Don't get in my space, you know. Yeah. So whenever you start looking at your, your communication patterns, especially when it comes to storytelling, if you can, if you can storytell to the child, that's what everyone's going to listen to. Um, so again, with me in the kids books, when people bring me these real life lessons, I'm like, how do you tell a kid this? And they're like, well, you know, I'll tell them this. I'm like, they're not going to listen. Tell them in a story and then they'll listen. Yeah. Well, shit. I mean, one of my, this was one of my, uh, episodes was, hey. oh, the places you'll go. And this is a yeah. book that I, I didn't have as a kid. I, for whatever reason, I hadn't heard of it. I, I had heard of it, just never had it. And, um, my my buddy who came on the episode, international speaker, asked him what he wanted to cover, and this is what he came up with. Wow! Um, I'm like, all right, I trust him. There's got to be something amazing in this, so I bought a copy, read it, and yeah, it's that storytelling where yes. it's like a Disney movie where kids go in, they see one thing, and the parents see all the little kind oh, yeah. of double meanings that are in there. Like that's why, thank God, because that way we can enjoy it somehow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just that power of telling it simply but this is a very profound book i mean yeah, uh, i think any adult needs to to read that about yeah the places they'll go what that path looks like so that's yeah. why i love that you you aside from writing for professionals adults seasoned executives you're also writing for for kids as well especially when you're that curious about psychology you're reading the book that you just shared and those lessons of the adult yeah. the parent and, and the kid yeah oh that's a good one um so yeah, when I when I read that book, I, it kind of opened up the door to like this is where I need to be and uh, explain my childhood a little bit. And then being a child in the military, I started looking at books like this. And this is another. This is an Air Force book. This is from the Air University. It's called From the Line in the Sand. This is Desert Storm Lessons. Okay. And this is leadership um, from each one of the different uh, professional um, aspects. So. I uh, have like a tank commander here. I have an aerial commander here. I have uh, uh, another GPS operator. And, and I went through this book and I was like, man, this is great. Why don't we do this more often? Yeah. I mean, it's storytelling yeah. to someone who's never, you know, when that book was written, the Gulf War was over and we weren't into the war on terrorism at all. Yeah. So yeah. 
people are like, I'm interested in what just happened. Tell me the story. And that's what's captured in there. And then I do that in my book. So I, I kind of pair those two um, and I make it really simple for the kids uh, to like pick it up and, and read it if they want to. But then I have stories in here of like when I stole a secret service vehicle. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and there's a whole thing on that. And <laughs> yeah, did I know it was a secret service vehicle when I took it? Yeah, I did. But I had to weigh the options of like, is this how much trouble am I going to get into for stealing this to make sure that the president of the United States can make sure he needs to do what he needs to do. And uh, yeah, so that story's in there. People love that story. People love hearing White House stories about like the president of the United States. Those are in there. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I mix the storytelling with the lesson and that works well because each one of those is a stage presentation. Yeah, no, I love that. So my, my next question is always, so does it make sense from your childhood that this is what you're doing? Can, how do you tie that in? You know, what, what are, what are the foundations and the roots from your childhood that appear in the work you're doing today? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot, everything correlates, you know, you become the person you are based off of your past experiences to be the person you need to be in the future. So all of the, the childhood experiences and being nomadic and, and being aware uh, as, I, as I grew up in the military have turned me into somebody that, that can take a look and be real. Like, here's something that doesn't happen in the world right now. Uh, people are afraid to point out the truth. So whenever something's broken, they, they like to say, well, I think their heart's in the right place. Instead mm -hmm. of like confronting the person and being like, Hey man, you kind of suck at this. And if you oh, don't yeah. get better, um, there's, there's going to be some consequences and it may be, you, you just aren't on the team anymore. Yeah. Um, so like my childhood with my dad, he was very real with me. He'd be mm -hmm. like, that's not cool. And I'm like, appreciative of that. <laughs> that's not something I think parents do anymore, uh, at, uh, at grand scale. They, yeah. Are, are a little bit more um nice um they want to be yeah friends. i mean you could say i mean you know the words that i've heard are like coddling or helicopter parent thing, things like that no I, yeah. I i i see where you're going yeah i get that i get that so my childhood was was very real and then my military experience was very real too and i welcomed it so the first time i ever got feedback um was when i didn't put paper in a printer and I got yelled at and yeah. uh, I mean, yelled at, uh, cause there was not paper in a printer. And that was when email was new and people printed out their emails. So they couldn't print out their email. And uh, that was a very important email. And I got yelled at, and I was like, Hey, thank you. Thank you for telling me that I'm going to make sure that that always has paper in it. And it's the smallest thing in the world. But after that, everything became non problematic. They just came to me and said, Hey, this sucks. And I'm like, cool. Yeah. I got it. And then, they're like, hey, you should work for the general. And the general's like, yeah, I appreciate your candor. And I'm like, awesome. I'm There's not the rude. word. There's the word. There's the I'm word. I'm not rude. Yeah. There's I'm the not word. rude. Yep. So, you know, because um, that is that book, Radical Candor. It came up in a conversation a couple of weeks ago where, same kind of thing, where we, the person I was talking to, we didn't think that in society, we had, society needs to hear more but it's all yeah. about how you put it it can't be about your ego you got to nope. be honest and authentic about it um that way it builds trust but yeah, you know true. we talked about you know where it comes from i mean for me i i think i've always been that way just because i want to save us all time yeah. and and if i yeah. want to sugarcoat it and it it's got me in trouble because i got rbf man if i'm not smiling i look like an assassin right <laughs> Uh, but there's something about that, man. If, if you, if you can't be honest with somebody that they're not performing, yeah. that they're not pulling yeah. in, you know, the, the, the effort that they should, or providing the effort that they should, it's disrespectful to them. You know, it's like it you, is. you, you know, that they can't handle it. Um, you're deciding for them, like sounds hokey or sounds, you know, like hyperbole, but you're deciding their fate. I'm going to decide for them what's best for them. I'm right. going to protect them. Um, but there's something to be said about just being honest, saying what needs to be said. Yes. In the right way with the right tact, couth, the words, whatever it is, just That's to so demonstrate true. it's not from a point of ego, but 
so that we can all move together in the in the right way. So, and when you said candor, it's like it resonates because that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Well, and it's missing uh, in yeah. a lot of yeah, non-conforming absolutely. organizations. So that was one of the that was one of the key things that I pulled aside was to focus on people. So I pushed my book out. I had a lot of leaders, like proven leaders, read it. And one of the leaders came back and was like, Hey, I don't, I don't agree with this. Like you need to make your people better if they're not performing. I'm like, okay, let me explain this to you. Like in my experience, if a person isn't performing, they're not on the team anymore. That's just what happens. And they're like, no, no, you got to work on that. I'm like, I don't have time to work on that. I'm going to tell them once. And then if they aren't performing, then bad things happen, man. And like yeah. in life or death situations at, I don't want to, I don't want that on, on my conscious. I don't, I don't want to be like, Hey, that person's got a good heart. And they, they ended up getting somebody like in trouble and that's bad. So yeah, uh, all the jobs that I was in, I couldn't do that. Um, and then different levels of stress. Right. So you're absolutely right. If you're not telling somebody that they're broke, they don't know that they're broke sometimes because their mom loves them. Their dad loves them. Everyone thinks that they're great. So why would they be broke? It's somebody else's fault. Uh, and whenever you tell them, hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not being rude. It's just that did not work. And I think you know that. Then they're like, yeah, yeah, I kind of felt that too. And they get that sense of relief <laughs> um, that, that uh, just isn't in there. But yeah, my number one thing, man, it's in the Bible, right? Uh, the golden rule, uh, treat others like you want to be treated. Um, that... Uh, that's that's how it is, man. If you want yeah. that feedback and everyone says they do until they get it. Yeah. <laughs> how how do you want that feedback? You yeah. Know? And if you think about it like how you would want to receive it, that goes over so much smoother than how it's perceived to be said. Very well said. Yeah. I, hey, listen, I love leadership. I love working with people. I love helping people get better and helping each other get better. I, but at a certain point, if you've put in some effort and I mean, you've been in some high stakes environments where there's no room for waiting for somebody to come around, no. you know, they, they, they get the message they're told you have to deliver and that's it. If you don't, you're out. Um, but even in, in less, lesser staked environments, I think it's important to help people, but at a certain point, it just means that this person's not in the right environment. It's, yeah. it's not right for exactly. us as an organization. It's not right exactly. for them. You're still doing them a disservice by trying to fit, you know, their square peg into your company's hole. I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. But nope. that's another example of of just that candor where it's like, you know, maybe you're just not in the right spot. Um, there is flexibility to work with somebody. But at a certain point, it's like, OK, as much as I love leadership, as, as much as I love coaching and developing people at a certain point it just it just isn't not everything has to work out you know you can't be um it's that toxic positivity oh if we keep going it'll work if we keep going it'll work like you said the the level of severity uh, and urgency uh varies but there's urgency there something is on the line whether it's war and lives are on the line or a job and people's jobs are on the line uh, you know whether it's a white collar environment, if somebody's not performing, it's going to trickle through and it's going to cost jobs. Like something's going to, something's going to fall through. And I don't know, there's just too much on the line to sugarcoat um, too That's much true. for people, way too much on the line. Well, so like, can I introduce this? Cause you just brought up something and I was like, man, this is magic. So sure. I got to say, it. all right. So when leadership turns into management, that's when people start to have problems. Uh, so at, these teams that I've that I've been in and led in elite levels, they are, they are different because the people that were on the teams had to perform at a higher level. So if you want elite level results, you have to get elite people mm -hmm. on your team. And if you're managing them, are they elite? And you turn in from you, you turn yourself in from a leader into a manager. And when you turn from a leader into a manager, then you start to slow down. And that's where problems start to happen, I think. So, uh, yeah, man, when, when you were explaining that, I was like, wow, this is gold. Like, for real, like, that makes so much sense. Yeah. I've, I've never said that. I've never had that that come out on a podcast. It's good. 
<laughs> I appreciate that. Um, Atlas, yeah, we obviously we've talked about leadership. You've given examples, you've provided uh, references from books from your own life. But how would you, if you had to define leadership, what does leadership mean to you? And again, you've given so many insights, but if you just had to put it in a phrase or two, what what is the meat of leadership for you? Yeah, leadership is providing vision so that an objective can be completed. So, and then keeping people on, on course. So there's three parts to, to my leadership model. The things that I found that correlated in my book uh, to always come up when it comes to a leader are people, time, and money. But you can only lead people. You can't mm -hmm. lead time and you can't lead money. So whenever it comes together, leading people is it. You got to love people. You got to be in the weeds with people. You have to understand where they're at. And people, people, people. It's like the location, location, location of real estate agents. So you have to be in tune with people. And that is the crux of leadership uh, when it comes down to it. Uh, but on that, you have to provide them with a vision because if they don't know what to do, they're not going to do it. If you don't provide them with an objective, they're not going to know where to go after they did what they're supposed to do. If yeah. you don't provide them with some kind of clarity as to how everybody works together, well, then they're going to start working on other people's tasks. So everyone has a different leadership problem and everyone has a different leadership style. And finding that is, is why there are five billion dollars spent on this every day trying to figure out this leadership problem solution it's yeah. not a one size fits all uh so that's a long answer to your question no 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 <laughs> not at all not at all when you mentioned um in, in that answer you, you mentioned loving people can you speak more to that yeah yeah um a lot of people care about themselves more than than anything else. And whenever you put that aside and you start to look at who you have on your team, you're going to figure out some things. Um, when it kind of goes into, uh, I just applied for a TEDx stage, kind of goes into this, this TEDx talk that I'm, that I'm preparing for. Um, and it's Simon said, Simon Sinek said, uh, it starts with why. And he described that as a leadership excellence model. And uh, I'll add to that because the five W's are something that I was raised with, you know, who, what, where, when, and why. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first part of that is who. Uh, if, you, if you start with who, you can figure out the problem solutions a lot faster than, than ever before. So here's what's asked in business. If you're presented with a problem, a task, marketing, operations, sales, doesn't matter. They're going to ask you, how much is it going to cost? How much time is it going to take? And then they'll ask you, who's going to do it? So on my model, whenever you flip that and you ask who's going to do it, you're going to save yourself time because they're going to tell you how much time it's going to take. And they're not going to be objective to it. They're going to tell you probably less time than you think. And they're going to tell you how much money which is probably also going to be less than what you would budget if you just found somebody after you pr gave the parameters. <clears throat> so uh, all of that ties together into a, uh, what I like to call a platinum process, man. Um, and it's the golden rule plus time is money. Uh, and then money makes the world go around. All of that comes back into manpower, moments, and moolah. And the longer the word, the most of the more important it is. So manpower is back to people. That, that's where it's at. Just rambled on for you. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. A lot of uh, solid nuggets you're providing, man. Mm -hmm. um, all right. At this point, let's jump into the book. If you could um, introduce the book, your book that we're talking yeah. about, that we're going to talk about and what led you. First of all, where does this fall? This is the newest book. Can you, yeah. before we jump into that book, let me take a step back. Can you just um, briefly go through yeah. the other books that you have? Just kind of, this is the title. This is why I wrote it. This is the title. This is why I wrote it. Just to kind of get a sense of your trajectory, your path as an author. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you, you've and, and what it. was the impetus for each one? What was the trigger that made you want to write it? Yeah. Um, you've described this a couple of times, like, 
uh, whenever you're an author, you write the first book, uh, you get the itch to write a second and a third and a fourth. It never stops. Um, so the first book I wrote was this, and then I pushed it out. And my son came up to me one day, and he's like 14. He's like, I'm going to be driving soon. How do I make money, Dad? And uh, I was like, Whoa. Well, when I was a kid, I used to mow grass and like toss papers and you can't do any of that anymore because adults do that now. Um, so I was like, hey, man, um, every fundraiser place that has has been a, a place where we go to ask for money in politics, everybody's house, they're usually an author. They've written a book. I was like, write a book, man. And he's like, yeah, we should write a book. And I'm like. Dude, I don't know what this French word we is, but like I said, you should write a book. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. like, he's like, well, how about this? I'll write a book, you write a book, and then we'll compare notes. And then I wrote the book and he did not. And he goes, let's just go with that. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I wrote this book, A Fox in the Box. It's uh, a story based off of uh, my, my dog that looks like a fox. Um, so when I was sitting there thinking about what I was going to write, I pulled a nugget out of here and i was like okay and then my dog walked by and looked at this amazon box and and uh i was like oh fox in a box that, that sounds like a good kid's title <laughs> and then it talks about problem solving teamwork the 101s of leadership um how to how to get a vision what to do when there's a problem presented it's got so many layers man mm -hmm. but it's literally 35 40 pages and yeah. most of it's pictures right because it's a kid's book. So like the, at the end, I have uh, some some uh, some questions to ask, but like the fox and the ox are the main characters. And so we wrote the book. He edited it. He's like pointing out things in the illustration. And uh, the next day we were best selling. <laughs> I was the best selling author and he was a best selling illustrator because who knew? There are no kids leadership books out there at yeah, all. Yeah. So I'm creating this whole new genre of leadership books for kids. And our goal is to now uh, get more books in the hands of future leaders than Dr. Seuss sold, which is 600 million during his life. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're uh, a couple hundred thousand into that. Uh, but yeah, we wrote uh, these books over the last four years. These two became bestsellers. And then I started looking at the process and this one became a number one. And then this one, uh, this one broke Amazon. You still can't get it. Um, wow. So uh, those books are all part of a kit that I give to parents. And what I'm seeing is a lot of feedback from parents who are proven leaders. And they're like, your story opens up a new dialogue with my kid every day. We read it every night. And I'm like, gosh, this is cool, you know? Um, so uh the first one the fox in a box just got translated into spanish so that we can do that um and so all of that was just a side project so that i could figure out how to self-publish this and yeah actually went through a bestseller publishing after uh listening to their pitch and they, they guarantee a best-selling like uh launch and uh that was before i did all those uh, but uh, all of it's the same material and mm -hmm. it connects parents with with kids uh, at bedtime, at the dinner table, during, you know, grand, grandkids come over and they have stories that come mm -hmm. out of these books. Yeah. Uh, and then that correlates with this book, which I've been working on for three years now. Uh, and that's so that's the best selling author part of this. I've sold thousands of these books. Uh, and I'll have a lot of testimonials from that. And then um, my next book is uh, Start With Who. Uh, and, and that spins off of this one easily. So that's uh, those are my other four books. This one's coming out here this week. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, just because I think about just talking to my own kid and, and obviously being a coach, I talk to him in that kind of, in that kind of vein, but not the same words. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just to get oh, him yeah. thinking in a certain way. So for me, leadership coaching is always, it's the same lessons from daycare to retirement. It's just it's... the words that you choose and the vernacular you use based on where they are in their life and their career. But I love the fact that you do that because I think it's so important to get them thinking about that in that fashion 
at that age, especially, yeah. you know, that window you gave of the four to eight. Yep. You know, aside That's from what they take in from from the people around them, what what is being read to them? Aside from the experience of their parents, what are they bringing in as these extra tools, these books to read yeah. to them and just get them in that mindset before. Listen, this is a completely fucking different world than I grew up in. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. just the last 15, 16 years with the Internet, uh, not the Internet, but social media and just all the toxicity that that's boiling up. I mean, being a father now is you can't say, oh, I drew all my lessons from my dad. Like it's just a completely different world. So yeah. any tool that I can use like that to get them thinking for themselves, their self-leadership. Kudos to you, man. I, 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 I love that. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Um, well, so the world's a stage and your kids are watching you as the main character. So if you spend time with them and you take them, you know, to your stage and you provide the lessons that you're learning, man, that's better than anything you can do. Plus, like I always used to say, when you step on stage, people remember how you feel. But yep. when you put it in a book, people can go back and reference it. And they can say it again and again and again. And different stories come out of that, especially yeah. as a parent. So yeah. uh, parents have been telling me, you know, I, I'm reading this book. I'm, it reminds me of something that happened during the day that I never would have talked to my kid about. And that creates a different type of leader for the future, man. Because yeah. all this is noise, man. Like the only thing that books like this are going to stay because kids need something tangible to touch. And whenever they have something like this with a loving parent, yeah, they're seeing what leadership looks like from home. Yeah. And it's not, you know, it's not, not the, ba obviously you and I both kept going to school, so it's not the bash education, nope. but there's something to, okay, it's a book, it's a story. Okay. What's different from other books at school that your parent is telling you, here's an example of that. I've lived that, you know, I, I've, talk to people on here where i've admitted to my kids you know i've, I've had fears and they're like what like <laughs> how do you because no i don't i don't want them going through their lives holding that inside man i want yeah. them to be able to breathe as much as possible by giving them tools that um essentially show them listen you can be human you can be vulnerable um and learn as many lessons as you can learn what you can about yourself and other people so again kudos i appreciate that you're putting that out there yeah bro now, why don't we go, uh, let's go yeah. into the newest book. If you can introduce it. Um, this is the one that you said you started before the kids books, but then kind yeah. of drew the lessons for the other books. Uh, but yeah, if you could introduce the book and then um, just a little background on on how, do, how you decided to put it together, what you wanted to include in there. Yeah. Okay. So um, rule three, how elite leaders win started off with how elite military leaders win. And then I realized I have a lot of political influence watching like the top politicians. And I was, uh, I was pretty blessed and fortunate to go to the white house, um, under the Obama administration. So I got to see him, uh, in, in a couple different forms. When I was at the white house, I started looking at different ways of leadership and how that actually impacted different things. So I took out the word military, but in here, um, I have the rule three, uh, which rule three is for someone to complete a thought, they have to get through three things. So politicians use it in speeches. They go, and we're going to talk about taxes, roads, and, uh, improving the education system. And then in a, an adult mind, they complete the cycle. And that happens from childhood also. Uh, the, the rule three is like the Goldilocks principle, right? This one's too big. This one's too small. This one's just right. Mm -hmm. Or how many pigs fought the big bad wolf? Uh, how many musketeers? And then you go into sports. All of that is the rule of three. And for leaders, if you give people more than three things, they don't do anything. Mm. Uh, the three things that you give them have to be prioritized. If you give them three things, they'll do it every time. Um, and as a leader, you get three tasks. Your focus should be people, time, and money. Again, like manpower moments and, and money. Those are the things that you need to focus on in order to be effective. Anything else is noise. And other people should be working on it anyways. So um, people first is the, is the first rule. 
And I found that to be extremely vital uh, to every winning organization. And if you treat people right, if you treat them well, um, it's different than actually caring about them. And people can sense that, like you said earlier in, in the in the program, uh, people are really good at, at sniffing out fakes. Mm. And they will sniff you out and not do what you're saying just because you're coming across fake. Uh, so how do you apply that mantra? That That's a chapter. Um, I go into time because if you can do people and time, you're going to win a lot. Uh, I've managed billions of dollars, man. Um, and what happens with that is people in time actually get you more money. Uh, so the last principle of money, if it's important, it always gets paid for, man. So the way we do things in the world is backwards. We shouldn't be asking how much it's going to cost before we ask how much time it's going to take and then who's going to do it. Mm. Uh, and so I'm trying to expose that to the world because that's how elite leaders do it. They find the person and then they find everything else falls in place. And we spent a lot of time finding the right people in these elite organizations and people find no time to find Betty, Sue, Jeff, John, John you know what I mean? It's just yeah, yeah, everybody, yeah. Yep. John, it's, it's crazy how people just pick up people because they're like, oh, they're the cheapest. Well, yeah. Cost yeah. Cost or they fit the job description. Right. You know, so, like, so there's, there's that job description is kind of like, this is the minimum threshold that you need to have. And they don't look at, okay, who exceeds that? Who brings right. more to the table? Who takes the initiative? Yes. Um, and in here, uh, I, I include stories from like uh, my time in, in uh, special operations units, or uh, this is a, a, a rack when uh, General North who's a fantastic fighter pilot came out and, uh, and, and pinned a bronze star medal on me. General Clary, um, fantastic guy, uh, was our, the top air force general in Iraq when I was out there. Um, my time at the white house, this is air force one and me sitting next to the president's limo waiting for him to come off. Cause I spent two years with him. Um, I spent two years living in the white house and air force one. Uh, okay. so I got a lot of wow. like really personal experience, uh, being around him um, when he wasn't in, in the spotlight. And yeah. Just a phenomenal guy, man. So uh, the uh, the speech that I gave to put me on the national stage uh, for the Great American Speak Off, there's 27,000 people that, that competed for that TV show. And I got to uh, be one of the top 150 and, and we competed in Miami. But this, the, the stage uh, was one with this story and it's a President Obama story where uh, I was going in the room before him to see what was going on. Um, and so when I went in the room, I saw this, this man, he was kind of hunched over, he's old. Um, and he just, he didn't look like he was having a good day. And then the president comes in with his loud booming voice and he's like, how you doing young man? You know, and immediately this guy's shoulders rock back and his chest popped out and his eyes just got big with the smile that overtook the wrinkles that were just there. Yeah. And just because he recognized somebody, a recognized leader, recognized someone else, that person transformed Absolutely. and it was real. And he was very good at being real. He genuinely was in the moment. Uh, so you don't have to be the president of the United States to make that type of impact. Yeah. Um, and that's what people like. That's what people miss all the time. Like you have power just by being present and being positive and being you because right. he never changed himself. But like, that's what, here's, here's the dynamic. Uh, President Obama never changed himself from the stage to off stage. He was always the same dude, whether he was playing cards or playing golf or on stage, he was the same guy. And that's <laughs> just, that's amazing to be that kind of leader. Yeah. And I've seen that in winning organizations over and over and over again. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Those instances where a leader, you know, like I said, there is no threshold where that drops, you know, for me, it's more when people tap into that humanity in themselves, that humane side of treating yeah. other with respect. Like mm. if your leadership is founded in that, I mean, it's going to be on all the time, you know, 
Uh, and I just chuckled before just because in the office we were talking about somebody brought up rage rooms. Mm. And I don't know why, but President Obama came up with my like, that dude. There had to be one in the White House because <laughs> all the shit he had to put up with, all the uh. characters he had to put up with. And he just looked always so damn calm. Yeah, he was always um, calm. So here, here's the trick. He worked out every day. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of people... A lot of people don't have time for that. Mm. Dude, the president of the United States made time for it. I mean, I don't know how many times I woke up in the morning and then I would be like, I, I would just play around in the gym because I was always working. So it's yeah. just like I would sit on the treadmill or, you know, we always go to the gym every day. Um, so the president of the United States got two emails, two emails a day. Um, I haven't shared this, but I'll share it with your audience because uh, this is something people miss. People get consumed with email and staying busy. The leader of the free world got two emails. He got one from the chief of staff that said, this is what your day looks like. And he got another one from his personal trainer. He said, this is what you should do today. <laughs> two yeah. emails, man. And yeah. then every once in a while, there'll be a third one, you know, but like two emails a day. And he would run the country on that. Um, yeah. So prioritize yourself and your fitness and you'll always maintain that calm demeanor and you'll be able to take care of others if you're taking care of yourself yeah yeah it sounds so cliche but i mean obviously it's that's the truth you know yeah. um working out whether it's your mental health whether it's your physical health anxiety depression whatever it may be yeah anytime i start feeling sluggish or my mind is foggy i'm like what can it be and it's always I've been slacking off on my workouts. I haven't done my cardio. I haven't lifted. Like it's always, yeah. you can always trace it back to that. And when you slip, that's when everything else kind of slips. Um, but Atlas, I also, I love what you brought up about just those, those small moments, seeing somebody giving them a compliment, yeah. uh, compliment, excuse me. Um, just came up in a, 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 an episode I recorded yesterday, just the power of just putting good vibes I'm right. not a hippie, but putting good shit into your environment, seeing people like using their name. How are you? Like, how yeah, can I help you? How, like little stuff like that. And what I've said before is I think a lot of people think that to make big changes in their world, it takes maximum effort. You have to be prepared, but they don't give themselves enough credit for the small ripple effects that they can lay out throughout the day. Just in seeing somebody looking at somebody acknowledging someone because we're always like this we're just going through our day and we don't really stop and look at each other so there's that's very powerful that lesson that you just outlined about you know being yourself bringing yourself your humanity to whatever you're doing yeah yeah that's it so i have a lot of those stories in the book um and then like that i have a, a chapter highlight so okay uh, yeah i was gonna ask you how you break yeah. down the sections thank you for providing that yeah, so uh, so all of this is a story. I did a lesson learned, so you can pop through here and see the highlighted um, stuff. Uh, then, like, I put a story into each one of them, and then uh, the best practices are all highlighted on here. So um, it's real, real quick. The largest one that uh, <laughs> is is obviously people. You know. Yeah. Yeah. People speculate as to what kind of leadership focus you employ. Options I have seen have been mission focused, which is getting operations done. Uh, people focused, which is whatever the people need, they get. And then yeah. hybrid focused leaders, which is where you need to be. You know, uh, sometimes the mission needs are going to dictate more than what the person wants to provide. Like if, if they're like, hey, you know, my family just can't handle this. Cool, bro um yeah can you get somebody else to step on the team yeah. <laughs> uh yeah. that's that's just where it's at you know and uh so i see a lot of that stuff always meet face to face with your leadership team if you're leading other people don't rely on email uh don't rely on the phone calls or, or texts they get misread um those are the type of things that i highlight in here but i have stories that correlate yeah. with that kind of stuff yeah so which I think those are the, the most important pieces. The tips are gold, but yeah. just a story that kind of just outlines exactly what you saw from which you drew that lesson is just oh, yeah. key for, for the book itself. Alice, I, uh, 
at this point, I'm curious, and I always ask this question in writing it, what lessons did you take away from writing it? Some people yeah. have mentioned the writing process, the discipline of writing, the publishing process, which is obviously whatever they learned during, during the process, it's 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 obviously their choice. But I'm always curious if your insights, if your ideas of what you were writing, if the way you looked at it, if something evolved or changed or maybe something changed in you in general because of the book, did anything inside you kind of tweak just from having put the book out or that process of writing it? Yeah. Yeah. So the initial thing with the whole book was like, this is a pattern of three things. What are the, the top three things that a leader needs to focus on? Um, when I started focusing on those things, I started seeing a pattern of three inside the pattern of three. So, um, so when I wrote the first chapter on people, I realized that people is three things. It's yourself, right? You got to take care of yourself. We just talked about that. Mm -hmm. And then you take care of your team, you know? So that's the second crocodile closest to the boat, you know, but then the water that you're in is your organization or your mission that you're going after. And that's a lot more people. So you got to be connected to all three of those in order to get the first one right. Um, with time, it's like, how do you manage your time? Because how you manage your time is how your team's going to manage theirs. You know, if you're kind of like showing up at 930 sometimes, 10 o'clock, you know, you know, you're not, they don't care either. They're going to do yeah. exactly what you do. You yeah. know, uh, so the time aspect is you and then your team and how you're watching all that, you know, because whatever you're uh, whatever you're going to to look at is what's going to get done. Uh, so your prioritization on all that thing. But, yeah, I started uncovering these these things. And then I started looking at processes that were four deep, like like team building. Team building has four processes standard, right? That's forming, norming, storming, and performing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, are there really four? <laughs> so, so there's not, you know, I was like, ah, I started looking at all of that. I'm like, there's not four. There's four. Yeah. That's when everyone's nice to each other, right? There's storming. That's what people talk about each other. And there's nothing happening during a storming phase. Because whenever there's a people problem, people stop working on problems until that's solved. So you got to get through that. But norming and performing are the same. Like, yeah, I have two names for the same thing. Norming and performing. Like norming, your normal should be performing. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah. If it's not, then what What do you do it? Yeah, <laughs> like, no, that, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so like I started looking at these processes that were four deep and I'm like, I'm going to make these three. So I, yeah. I, I actually went through um, and, and redid a bunch of those uh, where I'm pulling it down to simpler forms where a kid can pull it out and be like, I get that. I know, I know what stage we're in. We're in the uh, play date mm -hmm. stage. That's the forming stage, right? You know, um, but now you have a toy that I want. Now we're in the storming phase. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, but after we get our toys, whatever. And then um, it's three types of people, right? Um, they're all, they all start with A. It's the asset. That's the person you can't do without. The asshat. That's the person that's always clowning and just doesn't <laughs> care about anybody. And then there's the asshole. And it, and if you know, if you don't know who you are, you're probably the asshole. But um, the, the asset, the asset and the asshole are all part of a team and they'll come out in different flavors. And how to deal with that is, uh, is something else that I put in the book. Um, yeah. But a lot of this stuff, biases and performing and breakout sessions and all this stuff, the normal stuff, I, I took a fresh look at it and uh, I put it in here. Um, in the military, we do weekly activity reports. Uh, I found that uh, that's when workers tell you what they did. And I think mm -hmm. that's stupid. So what I started doing was reversing that. And I used to tell my command, this is what I'm seeing from you. And just by reversing that, um, taking some of the aspects of that, I didn't realize I was doing it until I was writing a book. I was like, holy yeah. crap. That's why we were so successful. And that's why they were communicating with me better than other commands is because I was telling them what I understood and what I understood from the mission and what we're doing. Yeah. About. Why? Because I mean, like, regardless oh, of what they intended to show you, only what you took away matters. So you're like, you know, yep. this is what I'm actually seeing. So that's what matters. Yeah. And regardless so, of what you thought you were trying to show me or or, or bring in. 
Yeah, we, we made some magic happen during that time. And I was like, how are we so so productive? And it was because I was communicating with them. I was like, this is what I'm seeing. These are the awards we won. This is how we got the mission done this time. This is how many uh, millions of dollars we spent on this. And they're like, actually, we didn't spend that much money because I changed the process. And I'm like, I would have not known that had I not yeah. put that in my update. Yeah. You know, um, you know, these are the people that are downrange um, in, in the war zone. And they're like, actually, we just sent somebody else out. I'm like, I would not have known that. So, you know, it's the ability to take what you have and give it to the team um, and communicate that way seems to be missing a lot, too. And, uh, you know, if you can use technology to do that, uh, absolutely, people, people will definitely spend the time to do it. So, Alice, you said for your next writing endeavor, it was going to be start with who? Yeah, start with who, because that's my TED talk. And okay. um, I can't share some of the things that I want to on the TED no, talk. Of course, of course. Because, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, I can't on their stage because of their ah, rules. Like, gotcha. uh, like uh, so you can't do anything biblical on a TED stage. Really? Um, yes, yeah, so you can't talk about the Bible at all. But one of the big principles that I'll, I'll share with your audience um, is is like the story of Adam and Eve. That's yeah. the first leadership story. It's in the Bible. It's how it starts, right? Um, so God creates man. He says, mm, man can't do it alone. He's got to have a team. So Adam becomes the first leader, right? Uh, God tells Adam all the rules. You know, these are the two trees. Uh, the tree of knowledge, don't, don't eat from it or you'll die. So Eve's created. Adam tells the story. Uh, to Eve, and uh, he goes, "Don't, don't even touch it, you know. Don't eat from it. Don't touch it." So, just like our leader does, makes their own rules on top of the rules. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, you know, what's the first picture you see of Eve? She's touching the tree. She's like, "Oh, <laughs> it's all. <laughs> wow, I'm touching the tree." Um, yeah. And she's got that apple in her hand, right? And uh, she takes the bite, and of course, that's how sin's introduced, and that's the bad thing, right? So um, how that unfolds um, is Simon Sinek says, start with why. So how Eve grabs it is the snake says, hey, why wouldn't he want you to touch the tree? Why wouldn't he want you to have the knowledge? That doesn't make any sense. So if you start with why, you're going to get confused. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of the process, but it's not where you should start. Yeah. So she eats from the apple and then... Uh, God comes back in the garden, sees that they're wearing clothes, and, and God goes back to who? He said, who told you <laughs> that you were naked? And finds out that the first leadership failure ever happened. So when you start with who, which is what God did, God said, I'm going to create all this stuff. Who's going to lead it? And then uh, it's a lot. Who else can help him? Yeah. And then he comes back to the garden and says, who told you misdirection? So if you're consistently as a leader, starting with who you're always going to get things done. Yeah. Uh, so that's the, that's the biblical principle. Um, and like, the, like I said before, the rule of three is all about starting with people. You know, if you're starting with the right person, you're going to get it done faster for less money. That's just the secret, man. No one's going to tell you, but after 30 years, that's what I found. And, <laughs> highly successful, very high selective organizations and, in, in uh, political affiliations. That's how it is. So, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Atlas, when it comes to you, uh, when I have an author on here, I always ask, cause you know, you have conversations with people and bring them on and some authors are want to start with somebody else's book and then they'll come back or plan to come back to cover yeah. their book. You're here for your book. If you were to come on for somebody else's book, what's the book that stands out for you? A leadership book? Uh, any kind of book. Yeah. It could be any kind of book. Listen, right, let's go. twice I've already had the Bible. I've had <laughs> yeah. Dr. Sue. So it doesn't have to be leadership. It doesn't have to be development. Just what just kind of blows your mind and has impacted how you operate. I, I, I absolutely love the Bible. I read the Bible every day. Um, there's so many lessons from the Bible that are applicable, whether you're a believer or not, you can mm -hmm. take the Bible and just grab those nuggets that were put in there for us. Um, so I'll, I'll give you that, but I got another one flags and heraldry. Hmm. 
So in this book, I picked it up because I'm like, this is cool. I've always wanted to like dig into symbolry. Um, and in here you have how leadership was created. Uh, so this is called a vexiloid. And what vexiloids are, are a way for people to come together and use one person, the leader, to dictate where the party is going to go for hunting so that right. everyone can eat. So they use these giant symbols that turn into flags. And now, uh, whenever you take command, you get a flag like this. This is one of my prior, prior, prior commands. You get a guide on, and it symbolizes the change of leadership. So like deep roots into where we came from and why it started, that one hits me hard. Because when I started reading that, I'm like, holy crap. That's the start of leadership when people started to get together so that mm. they could change something for everyone, not just themselves and work together. And then they, they took lessons from a leader yeah. and this leader showed them the way and uh, that made everyone eat. I'm like, holy crap. That's a, <laughs> that was deeper than I've ever been um, on, on a leadership journey. So I like that one. And then it's, it kind of explains how people, go in their different directions on leadership because every one of those flags has a different leadership yeah, style. Yeah. Every one of those symbols has a different leadership importance association. You know, there's a, there's a prioritization based off of what you put on your symbols. And I'm like, wow, this is such, this isn't a flags and heraldry book. This is a leadership uh, options book. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause it gets you to think about what, what, you know, what is important. Um, back in a time where okay this is you're you're flying your your flag each group each tribe was flying that flag if you were going to war you were flying yeah. that flag whatever it may be so we, a lot of thought went into the symbols on there what does it represent who are we and each clan yeah. whatever it may be you're right it was a different kind of leadership it was a different kind of personality so that's not what i expected for a book but i could see how <laughs> no but i could see how how that applies just because it makes us think about shit if we had a flag what would be on it you yeah. know if if that was the first thing that people saw when we were advancing in a war or mm -hmm. coming to a, a peace talk whatever it may be what does that flag represent if people see it in a book what are they going to think of us what do we want to demonstrate what do we want to exude so right solid choice man so in wrap in starting to wrap up atlas what just brief lessons what would you want people to take away from your book yeah, definitely. Um, the leadership problem is, is something you can work on consistently and get better at. Um, there are a lot of options out there for people to get help for free. And I am no exception to that. I give people leadership advice for free on all of my social platforms all the time. And it's based off of experience or lessons that I've learned. And people who follow me they they have that that whole experience there the book itself has a certification associated with it so if you're about a promotion or trying to get something done for your corporation to prove that you're working on your leadership you can definitely do that through my book and it's all included with the book i'm not asking for additional money like i said bro i don't need any money i just mm -hmm. want people to realize that they have a power inside of them that they can work on and make better. And then that makes life better for everyone. I'm a yeah. huge American fan. I love our country. Um, so I, I, I'm pushing this out to the United States first, obviously, and then our allies and, uh, you know, the worldwide sales are going to come out, um, and they're going to go to everyone that we're friends with <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. first yeah. before, before they hit somewhere else. But yeah, that's what I want. I want people to realize it's a, uh, just like going to the gym, man. If you go to the gym and you practice something, you're not going to see that change right away. Yeah. Uh, but if, you, if you're consistently going to the gym and you're working on your leadership, um, you're going to see a big, strong, important change in yourself that only you can make. And yeah. it's through books like that and through podcasts like this that will allow you to grow into something amazing, amazing. Yeah, I think people don't, they just don't know that, or they underestimate just how many tools they have at their disposal yeah. and that it should be a proactive exercise. It should be intentional. 
that busting your ass at work without kind of thinking about your thinking or stepping back and looking at your process, yeah. you can bust your ass all you want, but it might not work. Like you really have to be, you have to step back, be strategic about it. Always do the work, put in the reps. It's an ongoing evolution. So amazing point. So Atlas, anything else that you want to share? Anything else uh, you may have coming up that you want to share with this audience? Anything at all that I might have missed? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot of things. Uh, and for me, if you're following me on social and you hit me up on social, I'm going to reply. Uh, so, uh, you know, my social is really easy. It's Atlas Altman on all of them. Um, so <laughs> if somebody wants to follow me, that's cool. They can get that free stuff. Um, I will send you a couple books, uh, so that, you know, if you have people that are interested in this, you can send them the books or you can just send me their addresses. Uh, I'll give you like the first five for free. Um, so if, if somebody's interested in my book and they hit you up, just send me their information and I'll push the book out to them. Absolutely. Um, I want to do that for you, but like my takeaway for you, John is man, thank you so much for, for doing this for us. Cause it is really changing the world, brother. Um, like people get a different thing every time they listen to one of your your podcasts and you're changing the lives of thousands of people every day just by putting in this work. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, I, I wish I would have had you when I was starting out, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the, the, the whole book process. I would have been listening to your podcast a, a whole lot more uh, had, I, <laughs> had I had known uh, known about your podcast because um, it's really good, man. So thanks for what you do, John. I really do. No, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that sentiment, those words, that consideration, just because, um, yeah, obviously somebody sees the value in what you're doing and it obviously it motivates you. You know, you can only self-motivate so much if that idea, if that message resonates with people, it's, it's like a high. You know, somebody sees the value of what you're trying to create for them, for you, for your community. So I deeply appreciate that, brother. Yeah, man, for sure. And uh, yeah, man, thanks for sitting down with me on your book, Rule of Three, How Elite Leaders Win. Uh, I will share that across my social media as well as links to your other books as well. Uh, again, I love the messaging that you have for kids at that young age. I think that's something, you know, in a world that's growing up. You know, there's so much anxiety, tension, fear going on right now. I don't think we were taught the right tools as kids for coping. Mm. Um, we were taught a lot of information that we had to regurgitate and take tests and quizzes on and shit like that. But things like that, tools that you provide for kids, that's what I think will set that that younger generation on a better path. It's not the it's not going to make their life completely easy or perfect, but it gives them those tools to not forfeit who they are to society that's full of BS. So I I'm really appreciative of those. Thanks, man. And if there's anything that I might have missed in my conversation with Atlas, there's so much to cover. Uh, I could keep asking him questions. We're coming <laughs> up on an hour and a half. Please reach out. I'll reach out to him, take him up on his offer, reach out to him as well. Uh, if there's anything that you need from me, reach out to me and I will share it with him. Um, a great, again, great messages. So for everybody watching and listening, thank you so much for taking this time and spending it with us, learning about Atlas and his books, and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care.